Hi there and welcome. Today we're taking a look at the Epson HX20 and uh, this is the first laptop ever and um, it's pretty neat. It doesn't have a lot of memory but it has a very good keyboard and a big uh, fairly high resolution screen. Uh, I think we're talking something like 40 by 4 um, characters here and of course it can do graphics as well. Uh, on the left it has a little printer and on the right there's a cartridge port that uh, can be removed yeah, well, like that and uh, there was a small cassette recorder that could be plugged into here um, but yeah if you look at the front here uh, that's basically it the main screen the keyboard which is good for typing and uh, the little printer up here on the right side there's a on off button there is a contrast for the screen then we have microso uh, microphone ear remote on off uh, for a cassette player and a barcode input here for a barcode scanner and uh, then we have a reset button here on the back we have uh, an adapter and uh, this machine is actually very similar to a modern day laptop in the sense that uh, there's a built-in battery and you charge it using the adapter so you cannot run it uh, without the adapt uh, without the battery sorry then we have an RS232 connector and then we have a serial connector and uh, to be honest I don't know what the difference is between these two on this side here we have a cartridge port and uh, two screw terminals here and it was possible to get an IO port uh, expander to plug into here um, so that you could uh, take measurements from the real world uh, like analog voltages and uh, digital input as well so this was really good as a data logger or a process controller and uh, I remember in high school one of the teachers had one of these and uh, he was using it for that in the chemistry lab so yeah uh, I have seen this in use back in 82 83 and uh, it's a really really nice machine on the back here we have uh, serial number, voltages, uh, but no date I think and uh, underneath here if we can get it up there is all the EEPROMs and that's where you can add an additional one with your software it's actually a good design and uh, like most Japanese stuff all the good stuff was made in Japan uh, don't forget that okay so let's just uh, start up and take a look here um, the front panel the front of the machine basically consists of a big keyboard PCB here, the connectors are flex cable and uh, there's nothing really to see here and we have an LCD display up here with the typical uh, NEC controller chips the bottom part is, uh, well there's something interesting there are some nickel cadmium batteries from uh, RS components and I'm not sure whether these are homemade or these are part of the it's definitely not the ones that came with the machine now that is homemade but that's a good suggestion here I think I will uh, remove these and buy new ones uh, just to make sure that they don't leak yeah and that's not bad that's pretty good actually so I will do that to all the machines that I have and I redo these 1800 milliampere hours nickel cadmium that's brilliant now uh, the problem is, uh, is, is the back so uh, I guess we have to remove more screws to get it up now there's a screen as well for uh, well, noise or EMC suppression I suppose uh, or simply just to prevent the keyboard it's not for just and uh, no it's, it's, um, it's not only for keyboard uh, to prevent from showing up uh, EMC protection as well uh, because you can see there's a it's conductive, it's aluminium at the back so yep and we got it out 
and uh, this is the machine itself this is called the Mosu board the real Japanese name there okay yeah so uh, this is the main PCB and um, let me just take a quick look uh, to see if anything is familiar uh, this is uh, of course a Japanese product so we could expect a lot of Japanese chip in here but um, yeah actually not uh, this is the main CPU this is a 63010 and uh, this is a Motorola clone must be uh, from Epson and uh, the date code is 1992 so um, yeah, uh, so this CPU is uh, running at uh, 2.4576 megahertz, and there's a little bit um, there's some logic here uh, to take care of the oscillator. So that is the main CPU. Uh, to the left of that, there's a lot of logic, and uh, that looks like address decoding uh, and some uh, buffer drivers, and uh, that makes sense because down here we have all the keyboard. Uh, stuff the keyboard connector sits down here also uh, if we look up here in this corner we have uh, some R bands that's one from uh, Japan radio and uh, there are some R bands here as well and uh, they will take care of the cassette interface uh, up here then the power comes in obviously goes to an on off switch and um, then we have a little transformer here and some transistors and this must be a buck converter so uh, power comes in at too high uh, voltage uh, compared to the battery uh, voltage and uh, then it will be stepped down here to 5 volts. And uh, it is possible that this is both a, a bug and a boost, uh, both a step up and step down uh, so that it can run even though the battery is uh, almost flat. Um, so what else have we got up here in this corner? We have a little relay here from Omron and uh, that is used uh, normally to switch on and off the cassette uh, tape to reduce power to that uh, then we have the two serial ports here and uh, they go through some of them seems to be uh, going through these two here which is uh, CMOS devices the 5 volt uh, buffers and analog switch this is an analog switch and uh, over here we have uh, from Texas Instruments the 75188 and 75189 so these are for the RS232 level converters then we have a chip here which is called the 68022 and uh, that must be a clone of the Motorola 6822 and that is a peripheral uh, I.O. controller and um, if we follow the tracks they go down here to this uh, keyboard connector so keyboard and stuff is uh, controlled through here uh, next to that we have uh, a HD14681 and this is a Mitsubishi chip and uh, this is a real time clock and uh, this little crystal here gives it away that uh, this is actually a real-time clock. Uh, of course, this doesn't have a backup battery because the the um, the main battery itself, the rechargeable battery, is is the backup battery. Uh, when you switch off this machine, this chip still has power. And uh, actually, the same goes for this RAM here and this RAM here. These are static RAM, and there are two K bytes in in each. Two, four, six, eight. There are sixteen K of uh, RAM in this machine. And uh, just like the real-time clock, they have power when the, the power is switched off. And then the contents will stay in these chips even when you switch off the machine. And that also explains all these uh, logic gates here, because uh, you can switch off the power to everything and uh, they still have power. So we need to isolate uh, this part of the circuit from the rest. So uh, that, that makes sense. Now, between this RAM bank and this RAM bank, we have the ROM here. And uh, these are marked Epson Basic version 1.1 and there are um, one two three there are four of them giving a 16k of, uh, of code and uh, then there's one spare here and I guess this little dip switch allows us to enable this one um, as I said this machine uh, was able to store programs in RAM so it didn't need a cassette player and indeed the one that I have here is uh, without the cassette player because the program is just uploaded to these RAMs and they will stay there. Uh, I'm not sure if I said this earlier, but these machines, I have a few of them, and um, they were used by the Coast Guard. So they just kept the programs in here and, um, and ran it like that. And they have been maintained really well. Uh, I think the last maintenance was in 96 or something like that. 
and uh, we can see that from the battery pack as well that they have actually uh, uh, kept them running even though the original battery pack was uh, was gone uh, one interesting thing here on the back is that there's actually a fuse and uh, I guess just to be safe but yeah that's it for the machine um, if we just take a look at the little printer uh, this is actually a standard little uh, unit and uh, this is uh, also made by Epson I guess but these are kind of OEM things you can get them from anywhere even even today so uh, yeah actually this machine I thought it would be really difficult to figure out what is uh, going on inside but it didn't turn out like that uh, it's basically quite standard there are three custom chips in this machine uh, all uh, cloned from uh, Motorola devices uh, I'm sure under license but nevertheless uh, it's not a Japanese design so yeah this machine was uh, quite an easy tear down but anyway let's just put back the machine uh, to its uh, assembled state and uh, then I will uh, come back okay yeah uh, I just thought I wanted to say something here uh, I haven't finished the assembly or the reassembly uh, but you can actually see what kind of quality the Japanese are using if you compare it to the UK designed machines I mean this is just amazing look at the flex cable this beautiful quality uh, the things the plastic pieces that have something written in them are inserts plastic inserts because of course if you want to sell this in Japan uh, you need to have the pieces with text in Japanese so uh, I mean they really thought about everything when they designed this machine uh, it's really beautiful and the quality is really good and of course uh, this machine is still working so uh, yeah that is a testament to that Okay, so I plugged it in and it's up and running and uh, you can see after power on there are two options one is called monitor the other one is basic and uh, there will be a third one or a fourth one or a fifth one if you write your own program and uh, store it in, uh, in RAM then you can call it up and run it at a later date and we have basic and it says Microsoft and Epson copyright you can see program 1 is a 0 bytes long so let's try and print something hello world enter that went well 20 go to 10 and let's run that run yep and it's printing hello world so the thing is up and running but anyway uh, that's it uh, thank you for watching and uh, see you again soon